Well, good day again. Uh, let's get stuck into God's Word and let's pray to God uh, and seek His help as we uh, seek to go deeper in our understanding of uh, the Gospel and of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Almighty, may your Spirit guide us, we pray. Open our eyes and hearts and minds to the truth so that we may go deeper in our understanding and deeper in our love for Jesus, that we may live lives that honour and glorify Him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, continuing on, uh, Matthew chapter 21, uh, starting at verse 33. Words are there. Let's read. Listen to one another. Oh, sorry, let me start that again. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect its fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And they will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Well, uh, once again, remember this is uh, in the context, this is uh, Jesus' interaction with the chief priests in the temple. And this is the second parable of three parables in a row that Jesus tells uh, that really reveals something about his mission and, and the state of Israel. Uh, and so with this parable, uh, it, it'd, be, it'd be super clear um, to the listeners as they heard this, when he starts talking about a vineyard, they know he's talking about Israel. Israel is sometimes revert, referred to as a, vi a vineyard in the Old Testament that God planted. Uh, and so then for the landowner in this parable is God. And so effectively what this parable is, is almost, it's, it's like Jesus uh, <laughs> telling a little story that recounts the history of the people of God. Uh, and so here you have a vineyard that God plants, um, kind of like the Garden of Eden. And in that garden, he places his people. All right? And of course, in, in the mind of Israel, that's the promised land of which God places his people in the promised land uh, and expected them to bear fruit. Now, this was the call of Israel. Remember we... You might remember uh, earlier in the gospel, we reflected on how Israel was called to be the light of the world. Uh, and they failed. Uh, and that's the fruit that God was expecting. And so God sent them uh, servants, it says in the parable, uh, to see how they're going with this fruit, bearing business, this vineyard. Uh, and of course, in the history of Israel, that's the prophets. It's the prophets who come to the people of God to point out, hey, hold on a second, you aren't living the way God asked you to live in the law. And beware, because there's consequences for that. And not only that, the, promise, the, the prophets also promise about a coming Messiah. Uh, and just like it tells us in the parable, those prophets in the Old Testament, more often than not, weren't treated very well at all. Indeed, some died at the hands of the people of God. And sorry if you can hear the trucks today. Uh, it seems uh, our road's a bit of a detour um, for the main road today. 
But Israel, right? they, they rejected the prophet's message. And if you read the story of the Old Testament, what happens? Uh, God rejects them. Right? He uses Babylon to uh, come in and kick the people out of the promised land. The temple is destroyed. The people are in exile. And then what's really interesting is what comes next in the parable is that the, the landowner says, I'm going to send them my son. And of course, we know who that is. That's Jesus. Right? And what's really interesting is what these people do with the son when he comes. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Uh, they kill him. They kill him. And of course, Jesus is giving us a hint at what's ahead for him. Here he is confronting the people of Israel and they don't know who he is. Right? They're rejecting him. They're not... That, they don't think he's the Messiah, let alone the Son of God. And they're going to kill him. And so Jesus uh, poses the question to, to the people. He says, you know, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Uh, sorry, the question is, you know, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And, you know, the people get a sense of the parable, in a sense, the, what, what the just thing would be. You know, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they say. And then he'll rent the vineyard out to other tenants who will give um, him his share of the crop at harvest time, who will prove to be good farmers and, and be fruitful. And of course, what this is pointing at is the fact that the, the, the kingdom of God is about to open its floodgates to the rest of the uh, open its doors, sorry, to the rest of the world as the gospel goes out, uh, as the message of the kingdom about Jesus, uh, the king, goes out into the world. And where uh, Israel failed, uh, there's a sense in which the church becomes the new tenant. The church is the new Israel. Uh, and so Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now he's quoting Psalm 118, the very psalm that the people were quoting as he entered Jerusalem. Uh, it's a really interesting passage because here you've got another mention of rejection. The stone the builders rejected. Now it's not the sun, it's a stone. And what's really interesting about that uh, is its connection to the anticipation of God's kingdom. Uh, if you were to go to the book of Daniel, uh, and in chapter 2, uh, Daniel interprets the dream of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar where he had this dream of a statue that had a head of gold and then a, a chest of bronze and, and legs of iron and, and then feet of clay mixed with stone or something like that. I can't remember exactly the, the, the makeup. But, and then this stone comes, this small stone comes and topples that statue. And it's spoken of uh, in a way that this stone is a coming kingdom. Uh, and of course, that statue and its, and its successive uh, different... Uh, material that it's made of represents big kingdoms of, of the history of the world. But this stone's going to come, this small stone, seemingly insignificant, is going to come and topple the kingdoms of the world. And of course, this is what Jesus is hinting at here as well. Like the stone the builders rejected is Jesus, the king of the kingdom. All right? And it's going to come and it's going to spread throughout the world and it's going to bring down kingdoms, but not in the way that Israel might have expected the Messiah to come. Remember, to, to ride in like a war, a great warrior, to, to oust the Roman oppressor. No, this kingdom was going to be established in a, in a very unusual and unlooked for way. It was going to be established by the king dying. Now, that's strange to our ears, and it was, would have been strange to them to think that through. You know, he says, He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on he on whom it forms, uh, falls, it will be crushed. Right? This, this stone is going to be unstoppable. And that's God's kingdom. God's behind it. Of course it's going to be unstoppable. This is his will. This is his plan since the beginning of time. 
And what's really interesting is where this passage ends. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. In other words, they got it, at least part of it. And what did they do? Did they repent? No. They became just like the tenants in the parable. They began to plot how to kill him. Uh, now, what are we meant to take from this? Well, we're meant to remember that Jesus is the king. And that whatever happens in, in, throughout this world, uh, as history unfolds, he's still on the throne. God's kingdom will grow because it's God's kingdom. And it won't grow by our strength. Not that we can't put effort into uh, doing things that is going to help uh, God's kingdom grow, mind you. But it's always God working through us. It grows because it's God's kingdom, not mine, not yours. He's the Lord of all. He's the Lord of history. And so when we're faced with struggles in this life, like what we've been going through with uh, COVID and lockdowns and uh, you know the bushfires that are in the all these kinds of things that a part and parcel of living in a fallen world. Uh, we can take comfort and we can take courage in remembering that Jesus is the King and he became the King when he died for us. Think of the picture of what the cross, what happens at the cross. He's robed, he's crowned, and then he's raised up, just like a king at a coronation. Only he's robed and then stripped of those robes. He's not crowned with gold, but with thorns. And he's not raised up on a throne. He's raised up on a cross. And he did that to die for our sins, for the sins of the world. To be the demonstration of God's unfailing love to you and me. To bring in the kingdom. So that we can be a part of God's new world. Well, let's pray and give thanks for Jesus. Lord God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is indeed the King. He is your Son whom you sent to save us. He is the stone that will topple kingdoms throughout history. For the kingdom of God will stand as the kingdoms of this world will rise and fall. And what an assurance we have that your kingdom will prevail, that your kingdom is forever and that we have become a part of your kingdom because of the love you poured out on us through Jesus and his death for us on the cross. Lord, help us to shape our lives and to trust in Jesus day by day, remembering that he is on the throne. He is still king, no matter what happens. And Lord, we thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you have a good day.